name is Mark. I am the missional community director here at Avenue, meaning I am in charge of our small group ministry. I'm in charge of connecting people with other people in a real, authentic, vulnerable relationship so that the Holy Spirit can grow us in our lives and in relationships. So everything I see tends to, I see community in. Um, and I'm a nurse by trade. I'm not a pastor. So, Nate, if this is your first time with us, please, uh, yeah, come back next week, because Nate is a whole lot more comfortable up here than I am, and uh, a whole lot better as well. So, you are stepping into the middle of a <clears throat> nine-week series now called Sermon on the Mount. So, this is what Jesus would have told his disciples. This is Jesus' big deal. This is, was his mantra everywhere he went. He would have told this sermon, and the idea behind this sermon is to move us from a place of bad religion to a personal relationship. That as followers of Jesus, we're not defined by what we do and don't do. We're, defi we're defined by our relationship with Jesus Christ. So in the last eight weeks, now not last week, last week was our VBS celebration and Father's Day, and if you weren't here, I'm sorry, you missed it. We did have some really, really good barbecue and a great picnic and stuff. But aside from last week, the eight weeks before then, we've been in this series. So I don't know if you guys remember, but Nate had mentioned it's kind of a segmented thing. So week seven and eight tie in today, tie in with today. And that is that in my relationship with Jesus, what I do is, more, is not as important as why I do it. Motivation is more important than what? Being the work of God is more important than the work that we do or doing the work of God. So you need to know today, I'm not speaking at anyone in particular. There wasn't a family or whoever in the back of my head as I was preparing this. My intention today is not to step on your toes, is not to... Uh, yeah, make you feel uncomfortable. If anything, today comes from what the Holy Spirit has been telling me in the last five to six weeks as I've been preparing for today. So if you feel like I'm talking at you, if you feel like the Holy Spirit is tapping you on the back of the head, my encouragement to you would be to lean into that, to not lean away, to not shy away, but to say, Holy Spirit, what would you have for me in this today? What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to tell me today? And uh, Jesus' message was for followers of him, his disciples, those who followed him around. So if you don't know Jesus, uh, it's not, he's not really gearing this towards you, although I would encourage you to listen in. As I said, I'm a nurse, and so I have a kind of a little an interesting take on some stuff, so I think there's definitely some validity and some good things for you, even if you don't claim to be a follower of Jesus today. There's definitely some good things for you to hear today, so I would encourage you to listen uh, intently. So, we are on Matthew 6, 19 through 21. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Jesus says, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moth eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Treasure, it's... An interesting word. We as human beings, we all treasure something. All you got to do is look at a little two-year-old carrying around a worn-out teddy bear, right, with like one eye hanging down, the other eye's missing, and ears torn off, stuffing's coming out, right? It's just got a couple of threads holding the thing together. And mom or dad dare try to take that teddy bear from the two-year-old. He'll fight tooth and nail because he treasures that thing. And you even see homeless people, people who have next to nothing, pushing around carts full of stuff that they treasure. We all have treasure. We all treasure things. So treasure, the word, is things that we try to keep because of the value that we place on them, like the two-year-old, the value that we place, and kind of society too, so value that we place on them. And it's directly related to our will, to our dignity as a person even, and there's a tie-in to even our self-esteem and our identity, those things can be tied into what we treasure, what we value. And 
what we treasure is revealed by what we try to protect, what we try to secure, what we try to keep. So think of this. This is mine, this posture of, this is mine, you can't have it, this is mine, this is my treasure. Or this is mine, something we hold on to, we try to keep at all costs. And Jesus is talking to a Middle Eastern culture, right? And so three things of wealth in the Middle East. We see clothing, right? The purple robes you read about, all of that kind of stuff. There's wealth in clothing. I'm not really a a clothing guy. I mean, we do define today identity by the kind of clothes we wear and the the labels on our clothes. I'm not really a clothing guy, but uh, for me, how others perceive me, how, how I am received, I want to appear smart even though I'm not, like, to me, that's important. <laughs> and this middle word, brosis, is Greek. It literally means eating away. So the NIV, if you're reading out of the NIV, it may use the word varmin. I like the word rust because I'm a gearhead, and as all good American men know, the best cars in America were made between 1965 and 1969, right? The American muscle car era. And all the men in the room grunt in unison. So, ru- so rust, to me, I've seen beautiful cars destroyed with rust, right? Or the NIV says varmin. So there's this eating away. You get this picture of people in the Middle East who were really wealthy. They would build big barns to hold their corn and their grain, right? You think of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Rich man had a bumper crop. He built more and more barns instead of even giving a scrap to Lazarus. Well, they both die, and let's just say Lazarus is in a happier place, right? So there's this thought of, of wealth, of thinking for the future, of even retirement or 401ks. And then thieves steal by digging through, some of your translations may say. So you think of the Middle Eastern walls, right? They're baked clay. And so thieves would literally like dig through the wall to break in and steal stuff. Jesus is like the, the perfect financial planner. He wants you to spend your money well. More than that, he wants you to spend your life well. We have uh, lots of flower beds at our house. One in particular, um, I just weeded the other day, spent an hour weeding it, and it's no big deal, but I also spent an hour weeding it like two weeks ago, and all the weeds are back already, right? So there's this thought of, oh, over and over, spinning your wheels, and stuff of life is that way. You know, all you got to do is look around, right, to see people spinning their wheels, trying to hold on, trying to get more stuff. So Jesus isn't saying that stuff is necessarily bad. Driving a nice car isn't bad. Having a nice house, those things aren't bad. It's not bad when we own nice things. It's bad when nice things own us. And we struggle and we strive and we we hold on. He wants you to spend your life well. So back to this verse, wherever your treasure is, the desires of your heart will be as well, right? There's definitely an identity thing wrapped up in what we value, what we treasure. Think of the high schooler with, you know, the, the Jordache jeans and the, the, the legs, like, tied really tight and wrapped up. They don't do that anymore, right? Or the Coca-Cola sweatshirt. Remember when those were cool? Yeah, thank you, April. I appreciate that, Right? Kids would, teenagers would identify with what they wore with me. I was a car guy, so I identified with the car that I drove. That was my self-esteem. But man, if that car got a stretch, look out. Where your treasure is, there your heart is as well. So, we can't hold on tightly to stuff and receive what God would have for us. You can't hold tightly onto our things and still receive from him. Jesus later says, the same next verse after, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, that word also could mean generous, your whole body is filled with light. So this speaks about focus, about intentionality. If you're here on earth just to live today and die tomorrow, and you want to get all this stuff, then it's okay to work 80 hours a week because you're just working for stuff, but there's so much more to life than that. The 
But when your eye is unhealthy or you're stingy, your whole body's filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. There's this deep, dark hole within me, and no matter how much stuff I have and I try to shove it in, it just doesn't fill. There's always more. We say things like money can't buy happiness, but yet we still keep trying to prove that wrong. Yeah. And if you think your generosity is generosity and it's really not, oh boy. If you're trying to stuff stuff in that deep, dark hole inside you, how deep that darkness goes. A quote by William Barclay. So Jesus is saying, there's nothing like generosity for giving you a clear and undistorted view of life and of people. And there's nothing like the grudging and ungenerous spirit for distorting your view of life and of people. Do any of you know someone, have close encounter with someone who routinely takes advantage of others They routinely, every deal they work, they get the best of the other person, and sometimes they brag about getting the best of. I used to work with a person like that, and every, like, trade for work, everything at work, you left kind of counting your fingers because you're expected to be missing some. But that person's view of life, every interaction they had with people, they expected the person that they were dealing with to do the same thing that they would do, to take advantage, to try to get the upper hand. You see, we see what we're looking for. We find what we're looking for. And so if you think people are evil, yeah, you see evil. But if you think that God is a generous God and he gives an overabundance, you see generosity and you see abundance. Jesus keeps on saying, no one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. The New Living Translation, enslaved to money. Jesus isn't saying nice things are bad. Money isn't evil. The love of money is evil. And how many people do you know are enslaved to money? They work and toil to buy the next new car or the next phone or the bigger house or fill in the blank. There's so much more to life than that. He would ask you today, how do you view money? Do you view money as you are the owner and it is to satisfy you, it is to get more stuff, it is to hold on tightly to what's yours? Or are you just a steward of what God's blessed you with? That money is a tool to serve God, not to serve you. Money is the great test as to how much we trust God. And I know some of you guys who have, this is like your first or second time here, you think all we talk about is money. I'm a nurse. I really don't, you know, I can say I don't really want your money. God, I don't think, wants your money. He talks about money because of how powerful it is in our lives, how much damage it can cause to us. Yeah. So I have a friend who is recovering from an eating disorder, right? And so every meal, she keeps back a couple of bites of food on her plate. And I pointed that out one day. I'm like, what, why, do you, why do you do that? Like, we're trying to, you know, clean our plates. And she's like, oh, no, no, no. I have to leave a couple of bites on my plate because that's how I show myself that food is not a power over me, that I am more powerful than food. I have control of food. And I think there's a lot of truth there in why Jesus talks about money more than he talks about anything else. Giving him a little bit takes that power away from it and gives it to him. Takes that control that it can have over us away, gives it to him. Dallas Willard, he says, we simply cannot have two ultimate goals or points of reference for our actions. This is how life is and no one escapes it. You cannot be the servant of both God and things on earth because their requirements conflict. That's why the list of the Ten Commandments, that's why the first of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no God to take priority, priority over me, is the first of the Ten Commandments. He goes on to say, of course you can serve material goods, value them, use them well for the sake of God, for his kingdom. But that's just to do what Jesus said in the first place, and locate your treasures in heaven. 
The big house isn't the sin, holding the big house to yourself, keeping it to yourself, trying to keep everything nice, not letting others come in, not being welcoming. That's the sin. Loving money, being enslaved to money, wanting more stuff. That's the sin, not having the stuff. And it's not Jesus and stuff. I don't believe in Christian karma, right? I don't believe that if you come to church, you punch your spiritual time clock for the week, that good things are going to happen to you because I know too many good people whose lives fall apart. And we don't see that in Scripture, right? We see the exact opposite. That's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food? And your body more than food. So the problem, we weren't there in Jesus. We couldn't see the look on his face. We couldn't see the look on his eye. We couldn't see the look on his eye. We speaking this. I don't think he's coming at us from a position of shame and show us a better way. He's speaking from a position of abundance. If we can trust him in big stuff, surely we can trust him with little stuff. My mom, she's, she's a great grandma. You know, she would buy the really loud, obnoxious presents for my kids when they were little, um, probably to pay me back for me being a loud, obnoxious little kid. But she would also always buy batteries, right? Buy the big present and buy the batteries. God is giving you the big and the little. We can trust him with the little as well as the big. Jesus goes on to say, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Jesus wants to give us more than what our stuff can give us, that there is so much more to life. He promises to give us a life that is rich and satisfying, because no matter how much stuff we have, that stuff doesn't satisfy. The nice new car that you buy today, mm, a year from now, or that 401k, uh, a year from now. They don't hold their value, they don't, right? They depreciate, they inflation. There's so much more. So we're gonna try to play a video. Imagine your friend invites you to a party. You arrive and there's lots of people, decorations, food and drink. There's enough for everyone. When you're hosted by someone that generous, you don't have to worry about your needs. You can just enjoy yourself and focus on the people around you. Yeah, that's what a good host wants for her guests. And this is the picture of the world that we find in the Bible. Creation is an expression of God's generous love. He's the host and humans are his guests in a world of opportunity and abundance. And we're called to keep the party going, to spread his goodness. This is a beautiful picture, but it's not the way people experience the world. Rather, we find a world of scarcity and struggle, not abundance. And Jesus grew up in that kind of world. Under military occupation, people losing their land or families to debt and poverty. And yet, he would say things like this. Look at the birds. They don't store up food for themselves, yet they have enough. Or consider the wildflowers. They're beautiful and abundant, and they don't stress about their existence. And you all should live that way, too. But surely Jesus knew that things don't always work out. I mean, sometimes there really isn't enough. And Jesus did experience poverty firsthand, but he viewed the world through the story of the Hebrew scriptures, which claimed that our scarcity problem isn't caused by a lack of resources. Rather, the problem is our mindset that God can't be trusted. Maybe God's holding out on me. Maybe there isn't enough, and maybe I need to take matters into my own hands. And once we're deceived into that mindset of scarcity, we can justify the impulse to take care of me and mine before anyone else. And that leads to envy, and anger, violence, and a world where it seems like there's not enough. The party's over, it's turned into a battleground. But God wants humans to experience his generosity, and so he chooses one people, the family of Abraham, and he promises to give them the abundance that he wants for everybody else. God will provide what they need. All they have to do is trust his generosity. 
And through them, the whole world will see how generous the host really is. But that's not what happens. Abraham's descendants, the Israelites, enter a land of abundance, and they promptly forget the host who gave it to them. They act like it's all theirs, and like there's not enough. And it leads to war and Israel's self-destruction. If I were the host of this party, I think I'd just give up. But God doesn't give up. What he does is surprising. He gives another gift. Another gift? Yeah, but this gift is different. What God gives is himself. All right, and Jesus, the host himself, comes to join in on the spoiled party. And notice, Jesus lives with the conviction that there is enough and that our generous host can be trusted. His mindset of abundance allowed him to live sacrificially and generously even towards his enemies. And Jesus called his followers to trust in God's abundance like him. And that's why he said things like, sell your possessions and give to the poor, or don't worry about your life. He's inviting us to live by a different story, one that is built on trust in God's goodness and love. But living generously doesn't mean life is gonna go well. I mean, look at Jesus. He was betrayed by his friends and he suffered. And this was no surprise to Jesus. He knew that people would take advantage of his generosity. In fact, that was his plan. Really? Yeah, think about it. Jesus knows that we're all hopelessly deceived by this lie that there's not enough. Yeah, that lie needs to be defeated. And so that's what Jesus was doing when he gave us the gift of his life. Jesus' death was the ultimate expression of God's generous love. Yeah, God's love can turn death into life. And scarcity back into abundance. Or as the Apostle Paul put it, you know the gift of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, that even though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And Jesus called his followers to live like the real party has begun. Yes, he called it the kingdom of God. And our invitation to this party is yet another gift, the personal presence of God's own spirit that can teach us how to trust the generosity of the host, just like Jesus did. Yeah, and when you believe there's enough, you start seeing opportunities for generosity everywhere, with our time and money, our attention. Yes, one of the most important ways that we can experience the abundance of God's new creation is sharing with others because of our trust that God is the generous host. Well, yeah. I, uh, I love what I do here at Avenue, being a small group guy, connecting people with others in real and authentic relationships. And, and I'm in a, a few small groups here myself, and the stories that come from those groups, right? A, a, a close friend who has seemed to turn a corner almost in his walk with Christ, like is no longer struggling with doubts and all those questions, but is really making leaps and strides to get closer to Jesus. Or the marriage that a year ago was literally falling apart. Husband and wife were living in separate houses and, and it was a mess. But now they're praying together. Now they're reading scripture together. Now they're leading their children together. They're parenting together all the great things that God is doing in the lives of people here at Avenue. I wouldn't trade that stuff for a thousand Teslas. I wouldn't trade that stuff for anything. To be able to link arms with God and be a part of his hands and feet, be a part of what he's doing in people's lives, guys, there is, there is nothing that we can buy or own or have that comes even close to filling that within us. But Creator God, He knows us. He knows us very well. Which is why Jesus goes on to say, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Now, as a healthcare professional, I can tell you the answer to that question is no. Right? It's a rhetorical question. Actually, anxiety and worry affects about 40 million U.S. adults. It creates things like insomnia and ulcers, makes you sick to your stomach, gives irritable bowel syndrome. Some studies suggest that anxiety increases the risk of heart disease in otherwise healthy people. Anxiety brings up this fight-or-flight response within us, right? It's great if we're running from a bear. It's really bad if we're trying to fall asleep at night. 
Chronic anxiety uh, can cause depression. It can cause chronic pain conditions. It suppresses the immune system. It shortens telomeres. Telomeres are the things in our cells that prove, that show longevity. The longer your telomeres, the longer you'll live. When they start breaking down, our body starts breaking down. Worry, anxiety can honestly shorten our lives. Jesus says, why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory wasn't dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today, thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Interesting, when we take our eyes off of stuff and put our eyes on Jesus, things take, tend to take care of themselves. Remember, he's talking to a poor community. Jesus was poor himself, and he's saying these words. We read, you can read later in the, in the epistles from Paul, like, he says things like, I know what it is to be hungry, I know what it is to be satisfied, but in all things, Christ has grown in him, right? He's become closer. Jesus says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he'll give you everything that you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Yeah, worry. Again, I don't, I don't see Jesus speaking to us from a position of shame. I don't see him speaking to us as this. You shouldn't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink when he's talking to poor people. He's trying to show that there's a better way. But there's not shame in his eyes. There's love, there's compassion in his eyes. The psalmist says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. So if you're stuck in worry today, please don't stay there. Please don't stay stuck. This is from, you know, WebMD. Not Facebook medicine, you know, like COVID. This is actually something halfway... Reliable. Uh, so WebMD, how to deal with anxiety. First off, talk to your doctor. There are actually some things that can be going on um, medically that creates anxiety. If your thyroid is overactive, man, you're going to be anxious. You're going to be stressed out. There are uh, literal diseases that can be creating anxiety and worry within you. So if you are a worrier, if you struggle with that, talk to your doctor. There might be help. There might be something else going on that you don't know of. Or speak with a professional therapist. Uh, we all, <laughs> we all need somebody to talk to. And therapists give us tools to deal with emotional things that are so beneficial. So they recommend speaking to a professional therapist. And of course, no medical professional is not going to tell you stuff like you should exercise every day. You should eat a well-balanced diet, right? You should eat healthy and whole food and all of those things because they do impact the way we feel. Drink caffeine in moderation. So here's an idea. If you struggle with worry, be conscious of your worries. Allow them 15 minutes a day. Write them down. Use the same book. Write them down 15 minutes a day. Think about them. After your 15 minutes, you close the book. You set it someplace else. And when those worries come back to your mind, you say, nope, that's in the book. I will think about that tomorrow. I will give that emotional and mental energy tomorrow. I'm going to worry about that tomorrow. I got a good friend, he actually made a list of all of his worries, wrote down a few pages, wrote down a prayer at the end of it, you know, giving these worries to the Lord, saying, God, I want to be better than these, I want delivered from these, and he put them in a shoebox, put them at the top of his closet, and that simple act, then when he thinks of things, nope, that's in the box, nope, God's got that, God's going to take care of that. That simple act has been so transformational in his life. So, yeah, give them space, but don't give them your entire life. 15 minutes, write it down, put it aside. Learn relaxation techniques. Uh, yoga is really beneficial, beneficial for the body. 
Um, so you have sympathetic, right, the fight or flight response nervous system, and you have the parasympathetic, the rest and digest, meditation. Yoga, so when you yoga, don't, I don't, you know, the Zen and all of, all of that nonsense. When I practice yoga, I focus on scripture. I try to memorize scripture as I'm doing it, and it's very beneficial for me personally. Um, meditate. This is from WebMD, the word meditate. It's funny how doctors finally catch up to what God told us to do years ago, right? Be still and know that I'm God. Meditate on his law. So meditate. You hear mindfulness in the news today, right? Everywhere you hear is mindfulness, mindfulness. Yeah, God said that first. That'll help with worry, being in the moment, focusing on him. Uh, And this is another quote. Have a strong social network as a small group guy. Yeah. That's WebMD's saying, not mine, even though I totally believe in it. If you struggle with worry, have a strong social network. If you're a female today and you struggle with worry, there's a few women wearing shirts that say warrior, not worrier. We have a wonderful ministry to women here at Avenue. Uh, Elise Baldridge is actually one of the co-leaders, and she's in the nursery right over there. So if you're female and you struggle with worry, I would highly encourage you, man, connect with a woman you see with that shirt on um, because you're not alone. You're not alone in your struggle. You're not alone in your worry. And honest, proven, verified uh, medical studies have been done that show that you have greater life expectancy, you have fewer incidences of just about all types of disease if you have a strong social network. So if you're not in a group of people that know the real you, the one that the mask is off of, the one that you can show all of your crap to, I would encourage you, talk to me, email me, mark at churchontheab.com. I would love to connect you in a small group of people that have similar concerns, similar life stories, but that love Jesus and want to see yeah, him glorified. So again, be still and know that I am God. This is the opposite of the fight or flight. This is the opposite of anxiety. Jesus loves us, not because of what we do, but because of why, because of who, because of this and the here. And when we hold on to stuff, when we cling so tightly on to stuff, we can't receive what he wants to give us. We can't receive the blessings that he would have for us. And I'm not talking about more stuff. I don't, like I said, I don't believe in Christian karma. Like, I don't think God wants me to drive a Cadillac. I think God wants me to love on people. It's when I let go that he does real work within me. It's when I let go that, yeah, I see him moving. I can hear him. I can experience him. I can come along beside him and work with him. But you got to let go of that stuff because it's just dragging you down. So your homework. Yeah. What do you say you treasure? And do your actions match your words? And sometimes we fool ourselves, and so if you are really daring, I would encourage you to ask a close friend this question because you need to give examples of what you treasure. What's the Holy Spirit asking me to do as my financial planner? How is he asking you to lay treasures up in heaven and not just here? What is he tapping on you about? In what ways can I be more generous? And do I need to take any action steps towards improving my worry? Are you stuck in, the, stuck in this cycle? Sometimes, guys, we, we like the dark place, right? Sometimes we like the depression and the worry and just God is reaching his hand down to you, trying to pull you up out of that pit because life is so much better than that. There's so much more that he wants to do. There's so much more that he wants you to experience.
There's so much more that he wants to talk to you about. So if he's asking you to be generous, do it. If he's asking you that, man, jump out of the, get out of this hole, get out of this worry, lock arms with people who understand, do it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. <laughs> yeah. I thank you that you have eyes to see what we don't. I thank you that you created us and that you know what is best for us. And so, holy God, I ask that you would help us to let go of our stuff. You would help us to not focus on what we own and all of our belongings, but you'd help us to focus on you and you alone. And that you would use our stuff for your kingdom, that you would challenge us to become more like you in that. So Holy Spirit, I ask again uh, that you would continue tapping if you are speaking to some, that you would continue speaking. And maybe even tonight we'd be rolling around in bed that we couldn't get away from your voice tonight, that we would be obedient sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. God, I thank you that you love us where we are, but you love us too much to leave us there. So help us to be your hands and feet. Help us to be generous followers of you this week. Help us to see you, yeah, everywhere. In Jesus' name, amen.